Good morning, everyone. Thank you for all the trainees joining us in the YouTube platform for today's urology exam preparation session. We are running episode four. Hereby, I introduce Mr. Suresh Mathias, urology consultant from Overhampton, who has joined us as an examinee. Welcome, Suresh. Morning. We've got a trainee and um, we will start the mock scenarios, which will be 10 minutes each. The floor is yours, Suresh. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much. Good morning. So um, I think we are um, starting with stones for you. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So let me just show you. Seconds. Okay, so you've been referred a seventy year old man with recurrent urine infections uh, with dysuria no visible hematuria. His urine dipstick persistently shown non-visible hematuria. What are the tests you're going to do? Um, I, I, I'll see him in the uh, clinic and then uh, we'll arrange for the, uh, I'll review the urinalysis. Uh, if there is anything abnormal in the urinalysis, I'll send it for urine uh, culture sensitivity. We'll review the bloods, uh, FBC, eucinese, um, and uh, we'll, if, because it is a non-visible hematuria, I will arrange for a flexible cystoscopy and uh, ultrasound to evaluate the upper tracts. Okay, so prior to that, uh, the GP has decided to do a plain X-ray KUB. Uh, you could see it on the monitor. Talk mm -hmm. me through, please. Yeah, um, so uh, th this plain X-ray of the pelvis Mm -hmm. uh, AP, AP view shows uh, a radio opaque shadow in the region of the pelvis, uh, which corresponds to the area of the bladder. Uh, clinically, it is suggestive of a bladder stone. Okay. Uh, I, so radiologically, you mean? Okay, that's sorry, fine. Sorry, radiologically. Don't worry, that's fine. Um, on the history, what else are you going to ask? I will see if he has got any lower urinary tract symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, the le length and uh, du I mean the duration of the uh, of the urinary symptoms. If he has got any uh, new neurological problems, any previous urological instrumentation, um, so and no uh, previous past history. All he's had is recurrent UTI-like symptoms with dysuria. We have checked his previous cultures, which are all negative, persistently showed sterile pyuria. As I did say, no visible hematuria at any point. Any other investigations you'd like to do apart from an ultrasound scan? No, you've got an extra cave in front of you. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, have a, a flow rate and bladder scan and mm -hmm. also a CTKUB to see the uh, upper tracts. Okay, that's fine. So you've done a CTKUB, it shows uh, very minimal parenchymal calcifications, don't, don't look like stones really, mm -hmm. which you've completely ignored. So what are the causes for bladder stones? Um, there are, uh, bladder stones could be primary or secondary. The primary bladder stones are formed within the bladder and most commonly it is due to a bladder outlet obstruction, ineffective emptying of the bladder, any foreign body in the bladder, uh, parasitic infections, infestations in the uh, uh, bladder, what parasitic um, infestations you can think of? Uh, schistosomiasis. schistosomiasis. Uh, okay. You mentioned about foreign body. What foreign body are you aware of? Um, if the patient had any previous urinary instrumentation and if uh, any part of that uh, instrumentation has left a, anything in, inside the bladder, that, a stone... Anything more yeah. common? A catheter can co cause... Yeah. Uh, yeah. For, uh, yeah. Anything else? Um, if the patient has had any urological intervention in the past, any sort of surgery, what other possibilities, what other needs could be there for the bladder stone formation? Um, Don't worry, that's fine. Don't worry. 
Okay. Um, so how are you going to manage this patient? Um, for him, I have to uh, see if there is any uh, uh, blood, uh, features of bladder outlet obstruction. So, mm -hmm. And also before planning the procedure, I have to make sure that there is no mucosal changes in the bladder by doing a flexible cystoscopy. And the upper tracts are normal in his case. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll see what his comorbidities are, make sure that he's not on any anticoagulants mm -hmm. and uh, we'll, we'll counsel him for uh, a because, uh, and endo urological procedure at first, um, bearing in mind that because this is a big stone, and if it is a hard stone, which which will be difficult to deal with uh, endo urological procedures, then I'll make him aware that there's a high chance that he uh, might need a systolitho tummy. Yes. Okay. So um, prior to doing all that, your CTKUB, we did talk about some parenchymal calcification. Mm -hmm. but on the skull film, you could see something in the right upper quadrant. Uh, just just on the CT scout. What is the differential diagnosis you can think of? A calcification in the right upper quadrant. Um, well, it is in the area of the kidney. What other area you can think of which could be showing up as a potential renal calcification, which it's not? And, uh, Any other structures uh, close by? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in the right upper quadrant, it could be uh, calcifications of the liver, gallbladder. Gallbladder, uh, good. Okay, fine. So anywhere else you want to discuss this before you operate, looking at the size of the stone? Uh, I need to uh, in, inform the anesthetic team and yeah. also in the stone MDT. Yes. To see, okay. yeah. What, okay, so you said about endoscopic versus open. Um, looking at the size of the stone, are you going to consent the patient for both? Yeah, I will consent the patient for both. Okay, so because, what are the risks and benefits? Here? How are you going to consent the patient for? So uh, I'll consent him for um, cystolithopraxy plus mm -hmm. or minus open uh, exposure of the, I mean, cystolithotomy. Uh, I'll tell him that if when I put the uh, endoscopic instrument, cystolithotrite, mm -hmm. uh, if it is a soft stone, there is a good possibility that we can complete the whole procedure uh, with uh, cystolithotrite. But if it is a very hard stone, if it starts bleeding, if the vision is poor, then it is a high risk to continue with the endourological procedures. Okay, so which how are you going to manage this endoscopically? You said about lithotrite. Be more specific. Yeah, so um, I will... Uh, Put a more mayor uh, uh, instrument. A stone punch for such a big stone? It, uh, oh, sorry. No. Do you think it'll because be I'll, No, it will not be said. Sorry, that is a wrong decision. So I will uh, do it with the help of laser. So we'll do, we, we'll insert a cystoscope and laser working element and uh, making sure that the blood, there's nothing abdominal in the blood. I'll start with a laser uh, lithotripsy for this patient. Okay, how many watts is your laser machine? Uh, it is 50 watt. Okay, so, so what are the laser settings you want to use? Uh, initially, uh, I always start with the lower laser settings like uh, 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 5 hertz and uh, 0.5 joules. And mm -hmm. because for this stone, I can ramp up easily and will reach a, uh, I think it will be around uh, 1 joule and 10 hertz for, the, for a bladder stone will be ideal. What size fiber are you going to use? I'll use a 600 fiber. Okay. Imagine you don't have a laser machine. Any other options? Uh, I can, yeah, I can st uh, start with a, a stores lithotrite and see if, it, if, I, if I can start uh, taking small nibbles of the stone. Okay. And any other, uh, any other option? Uh, I can put a nephroscope and yes. uh, then uh, do a uh, uh, ultra, uh, ultrasound probe guided uh, lithotripsy. A suction lithoplast. Okay, fine. So you're doing this. Um, anything else you could potentially consent the patient for? So you mentioned about endoscopic versus open. Anything else? Mm -hmm. uh, if if uh, adequate time allows and if his uh, prostate is enlarged, then I can offer him the option of uh, our bladder outlet procedure as well. But I'll be really careful to give that option with such a big stone. Okay. So if you imagine you're doing this open, would you do the blood outlet procedure at the same sitting? Uh, if it is a uh, 
I mean, uh, if, 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 uh, if it is a really big prostate and if the patient is fit for further surgical procedures, if the anesthetic time is too uh, uh, allows, and if there is no bleeding and the uh, vision is good, uh, then, and if, if it is properly consented before uh, by the pre-op, uh, uh, during the pre-op workup, then uh, there's a, uh, we can proceed with a, uh, simple prostatectomy, uh, uh, retrocubic, I mean, uh, transvesical approach. So transvesical, what are the risks of having a prostatectomy? Uh, for, for this patient, it is the uh, chance of uh, bleeding, mm-hmm. uh, infection, problem with the wound healing because of the presence of stones uh, and need for uh, long-term catheter. And also uh, b- because of the presence of stones, there is chance of um, uh, stone uh, fragments getting uh, lodged in the prosthetic fossa and can uh, uh, cause uh, sepsis later due, 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 due to the... Uh, uh, Guys, it's time now. Okay. Yeah. Good. How do you think you did? Uh, average. No, no, I think you're fine. Remember, so this uh, kind of a stone, look at the size, yeah? Mm, mm. So yes, we've got all the endurological instruments, but you always play it to safe. I will discuss it at the benign MDT at first, which is your stone MDT. Right. Options going forward would be endoscopic versus open. They'll really push you. For my exam, they really pushed, come up with one answer. I said, no, I'll consent the patient for both. Mm-hmm. And they asked me about blood outlet procedure. I said, going back to his treat, it appears that this patient has never been on any medical treatment. Okay, Mm -hmm. so my practice is to offer treatment for the stone primarily, maximize his medical treatment post-operatively, then reassess his LUTs with a flow rate and post-word residue with an IPS score several months down the line. Okay, so try not to combine all the procedures because it increases the morbidity. Remember the clue I gave was persistent sterile pyuria in this patient. So although Mm -hmm. there is no obvious bacterial culture, you don't want to do a blood outlet procedure at the same sitting. Okay. Right. okay. okay. Um, but yeah, so you remember about stone punch. Don't mention stone punch looking at the size this of the punch. stone. Sure. Uh, risk of bladder injury goes up. So laser, you're right. Very good. Mm-hmm. You mentioned about nephroscope and suction at the class. Mm-hmm. Uh, suture is other thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. foreign body needed. Yeah. So commonest being uh-huh. catheter to sutures because of previous, you know, urological intervention, recurrent urine infections. And as you rightly said, uh, you know, schistosomiasis. Uh, good, very good. That's a seven. Anand, anything to add, please? Yeah, just uh, the X-ray findings. Um, I will add up maybe even two or three. Mm-hmm. You should be able to see that uh, the stone is has got a very high dense um, central core and a kind of a layering outside, isn't it? Yeah. So thanks. you can bring it outside to explain that uh, even though I may have a quite easy go in the first few minutes, I will be facing a bit more hard, high density stone in the center. That will give you an impression that you are quite nice in observing the pictures. The other thing is, if you closely observe just below the stone, you can see the catheter. There are tubes going around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see that. that. And if you follow the tube, you can see it's bending and then going over the stone to the side. So it could be a transurethral catheter or it could be a, um, even a um, suprapubic catheter. The other thing is the left hip joint of the patient. You can see age-related changes. It's not as good as the right hip. So if you look a little bit outside the box, I know it's very difficult in the exam. That will really fetch good marks. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Very good. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. That's great. All the best. Have a good weekend. We got another... Trainee on waiting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. Hi, Suresh. We got uh, the next trainee yeah. in line. Morning. Good morning. Morning. So you we wanted to discuss BPH. So we'll start off with BPH, if you don't mind. Um, okay. The time starts now. So this is a, a 75-year-old man who's been referred with bedwetting episodes and new onset hypertension. How are we going to assess him? So I will see him in my dedicated lots clinic as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. He will attend with a pre-filled IPSS questionnaire as well as a three-day bladder diary. 
On arrival, my practice is for my specialist nurse to do a urine deep, flow rate, and residual volume. I will then see him. I will go through his um, IPSS questionnaire with him, as well as his bladder diary, to further assess the severity of any background pre-existing lower urinary tract symptoms he may have had. I will assess the impact of these symptoms on his quality of life. And I will also um, use the bladder diary to exclude uh, nocturnal polyuria. Um, I will um, ask him about red flag symptoms, such as bleeding, uh, urinary tract infections, uh, neurologic abnormalities, and pain. Um, in addition, I will um, assess is uh, past medical history, full drug history, um, comorbidities, as well as his hand function, because it may need um, intermittent self catheters <coughs> in the future. Okay. Um, uh, well, you mentioned about bladder diary. So what's the difference between bladder diary and a frequency volume chart? So a bladder diary um, has, gives more information compared to the frequency volume chart. So the frequency volume chart just gives the number of times um, someone goes to void as well as the, um, the uh, volume of urine passed each time. While the bladder diary, um, in addition to the information on the frequency volume chart, also gives the uh, type of fluid the individual is drinking, the volume of fluids and incontinence episodes and yes. number of parts used. Okay, and uh, that's good. Um, so you also mentioned about nocturnal polyuria. Um, tell me more about it. So the um, the latest night, the latest EAU guidelines, as well as the ICS two thousand and two guidelines, um, define nocturnal polyuria as more than thirty three percent of total uh, voided uh, urine. Um, being passed during the course of the night in an elderly greater than 65 year old, while in somebody less than 65 is defined as passing more than 20% of the total urine volume during the course of the night. Okay, that's fine. So you've done your examination. He's got a, a he's got minimal symptoms. Yeah, all he has noticed is new onset bedwetting, slightly on the slower side, the flow. You've examined him, he's got a large palpable bladder and uh, a benign feeling prostate. What is your concern? So I'm concerned he may be having high, he may be having high pressure urine retention with overflow incontinence. What was his residual volume, please? So on this bladder scan, you've got a bedside bladder scan, it's more than a liter. Okay, yeah, so and then, so in him, I'm, I'm concerned he has, um, I, he has chronic urine retention um, with episodes of overflow urinary incontinence. Mm -hmm. um, in my examination, I will also have examined his lower limbs for swellings, yeah, symptoms suggestive of uh, renal impairment. In him, I will uh, do bloods, including uh, renal function, uh, mm -hmm. just to uh, be sure it's not dropped his renal function. And I will also have a low threshold to uh, do a renal tract ultrasound scan mm -hmm. to exclude hydronephrosis and monitor the, uh, and also measure the prostate volume. So he's sitting with you in clinic. How are you gonna get those ultrasound scan? So usually they can have the bloods the same day. And in my yeah. practice, usually if I speak to the radiologist, usually I can get the ultrasound scan on, okay. on the same day. Really. Right. So ultrasound suggests uh, mild bilateral PCS dilatation, large bladder, bloods are back, his potassium is 6.5, creatinine of 750. Okay. So mm -hmm. I will uh, pop in a urethral um, catheter. In I will clinic. admit him. Um, I will um, observe him closely for... Um, Sorry, you uh, said you'll pop in a catheter where in the clinic? Okay, so I will immediately, I will transfer him to my surgical assessment unit. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will, um, I will, I will, I will, then um, I will, I will put in, I will put in a catheter, admit him, um, uh, observe for uh, post-obstructive diuresis, diuresis, as well as um, post-obstructive bleeding. Um, I will uh, monitor his urine input and output very closely. I will be inclined to, to uh, treat uh, the, um, the um, high potassium as per uh, local uh, policy guidelines. And I will repeat um, a VBG shortly after treating just to be sure the potassium is on the low side. Uh, I will also do an ECG just um, at the point of admission. Okay, so if the VBG shows that he's profoundly acidotic, what are you gonna do? 
Okay, so um, I will um, I will liaise closely with my uh, with my colleagues um, in um, in uh, nephrology as well as the on call uh, I HDU consultant because some cases may end up requiring <coughs> emulsification, but usually most cases once we put in the catheter they start to diuries with mm -hmm. a fluid and other supportive management. Um, usually they, they tend to settle quickly and do not routinely require hemodialysis, but uh, hemofiltration, but that is an option. You're still in clinic. So what are you going to tell the staff nurse? You're admitting the patient via your surgical assessment unit. What are the instructions you're going to give the staff nurse apart from bloods and catheter? Bloods you've already done. So bloods, catheter, ECG, mm -hmm. um, monitoring of input and output, uh, treatment of the hyperkalemia, um, um, those are the only things that I can think of now. Okay. And what about the following next couple of days? Anything else you will be asking the nurses to do on a regular basis? So, yeah, so it needs regular weighing. Mm -hmm. So just to, yeah, so I will, I will weigh him regularly. I will monitor his blood also mm -hmm. regularly to be sure it's, um, it's, um, it's creatinine, it's improving. And okay. that, uh, yes. Anything else? Um, and then once it's all um, once it's all settled and then um, not settling, he's in you know he's just two or three days after admission. Well, right from twenty four hours after admission, anything else you can ask the nurses to do apart from daily body weight, bloods you said, strict IO chart, anything else? Um, sorry, I just need some more clarification. When you said the patient is not settling, is it that the potassium is not coming down or the GFR no, no, no. Is potassium is improving? So you've done repeat bloods. Anything else you will ask the nurses to do? Um, nothing is coming to my mind oh, now. That's fine. Okay, so your uh, hyperkalemia is treated. Uh, as I said, minimal pieces dilatation. GFR is down to 10. It has improved. It's slowly, slowly improving. What is diuresis? So um, post of that diuresis is um, when um, there is production of um, more than 200 mils of urine per hour for at least two consecutive hours. Okay, and how are you gonna treat it? So usually uh, most cases that are, uh, most cases are physiologic um, due to um, um, uh, accumulation of um, waste products in the body. And usually they tend to uh, resolve by themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually in my practice, I, I monitor the urine output closely uh, the first two hours is very critical. And if they are making more than 200 mils per hour, I tend to give 50% of the urine output replacement um, every subsequent hour. Okay. So if- yeah. Do you always give IBI? So if I, I'm aware some of my colleagues, actually, if the patient is um, not tachycardic and the patient is not hypotensive um, and the patient is drinking, they, they don't tend to give IVI, but usually, I some of the patients in my part of the country I see a lot of 90 year olds etc so I'm a bit uh, cautious that they may uh, become dehydrated so I have a low threshold to uh, give them some IVI 50% uh, replacement okay and what's the pathophysiology of high pressure chronic retention so it's um the high bladder pressures um that um uh, leads to um uh, um uh, pressure and reflux on the upper uh, urinary tract, which leading to the, 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 the dilatation in the upper tract. Okay. Um, any indication for doing a PSA at this stage? And when would you do it if you do? Um, so usually um, I don't tend to do a PSA acutely because it's going to be falsely elevated due to the chronic retention as okay. well as the catheterization. So usually I ask the GP to do it in maybe three to four weeks. Any indication you would think when you examine the patient with high pressure, wherein you would do a baseline PSA? So if there is abnormality on my digital rectal examination findings, mm -hmm. I, 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 I tend to do it. Or okay. if the patient is not improving, um, then I could also do it after a few days just to be sure it's not in the thousands. Okay. So... His diuresis settles down. Day three, his creatinine comes down to 200. His blood pressure is normalized. Uh, what are you going to tell the patient? So I would, I would discuss um, long-term management options. Um, for this patient is not for talk. So mm -hmm. his long-term management options will range from 
Um, Guys, it's time, please. Okay. How do you think you did? Yeah, I think I was. <laughs> no, don't worry. You're you're absolutely fine. Just the flow has to come up a bit more swift. Do you see the time runs out so quickly? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yes, you rightly said you will assess this. So how do you start? Bed wetting episodes, new onset hypertension. Deep in your mind, you're thinking about high pressure retention. Okay. So you would say, I will arrange this. You see this gentleman, an urgent one in my, you know, Lutz clinic, assess him, bloody blah, blah, all the rest you said. When you've assessed him, you're concerned it's high pressure, you would say, I would admit him as an emergency via my surgical assessment unit, catheter, ask the nurses, as you said, I would chart bloods, body weight, lying and standing BP. You mentioned about hypotension. You're worried yeah. about postural drop, yeah? You've got to yeah. do it at least two to two, twice or three times a day. IVI, you're absolutely right. Uh, conventionally, a lot of people pump in fluids. You never do that. You replace 50 to 70% of the previous hour's output. So the nice way of answering that would be to say, if the patient is tolerating orally, and if there is no significant postural drop, my practice is not to start the patient on IVI, yeah? Just okay. replace 50 to 70% of the previous hour's output. He mentioned about PSA, good. Um, I would have gone to TURP, but that's fine. Good. Um, Anand, anything to add? Yeah, very good. Uh, you are quite strong in the basics. I'm happy with that. But uh, beware, this is a very, very basic scenario. This is a scenario even for a medical student, even for a SPR trainee interview. So you should be absolutely confident and there is no place for any mistakes. This is not a very high fee scenario. And these kind of emergency scenarios, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, post-TRP, there should not be any lacunae. So be very, very confident in this. Good. You can go ahead with the second scenario. Okay. Thank okay. you. So we'll do some pediatrics now. Um, good to start. You've been referred an eight-year-old boy with uh, an undescended testis, unilateral on the left side. Um, GP's letter says it's over the last three years. How are you going to assess this child? Okay, so I will um, see him as soon as possible in my um, dedicated pediatrics clinic. Mm -hmm. um, he will come together with his parents or his carer. I will um, take a history to um, find out if the testes as previously ever been in the scrotum, if there has been swellings in any other parts of the groin or the perineum noted, and whether or not he has any other uh, congenital anomalies or uh, medical history. I will um, dig into his um, um, prenatal history, his delivery history, as well as his um, uh, family history to see whether or not there is um, a history of similar um, um, okay. illness. Let me stop you there. You mentioned about two things. One is delivery history. Why is that important? So um, if he had had um, major uh, comorbidity, uh, major prenatal um, um, abnormalities, usually they may have been uh, delivered in a, um, in, 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 a, in a tertiary center with a neonatal intensive care facility. So even if the parents does not show of the circumstances, but if they have told me that the delivery was it was um, that they had to transfer them to a tertiary center mm -hmm. for special delivery. Then I start to suspect maybe there were other uh, congenital anomalies. Um, so mom and dad say, look, there is no congenital anomalies. It is a normal birth, but he was born in 32 to 33 weeks. Okay. So um, so in that case, I would, uh, because of um, um, pre pre um, Preterm delivery yeah. is associated with the higher incidence of um, undescended testes. Yeah. So I would really want to really ask carefully and review the previous notes just to be sure the testes was ever in, the, in this scrotum. Okay. At, uh, and that brings me to the next question. You mentioned about this. How are you going to ascertain that? So I it says over the last three years, right from birth, how are you going to ascertain that? So I could, um, I could write to the previous... Um, uh, GP or, or I, I could retrieve this because usually at birth they will have had a baby check. Yes. So I can retrieve those details and just be sure. Okay. 
That's fine. So you've done that. Anything else on the history you want to ask? So I also want to know from, from the um, history if there is any um, other um, abnormalities they've noted. Um, and then I will carry out a, an examination um, examining the um, abdomen. Look Anything else on the history? Not uh, just history. Anything else? Um, if he had any other abnormal, that nothing else is coming to my mind now. Okay, so, don't worry. Okay, so you go ahead, examine it. Okay, so on examination, I will um, I, I, I will carry out a quick general exam examination with chaperone. I will carry out a quick general examination and abdomen examination. I will also uh, examine the external genitalia, uh, looking whether checking whether or not the testis is palpable in the scrotum. I don't expect to palpate it. Then I will palpate right across from the groin. I will gently milk down and see whether sweeping down my finger, sweeping down my, my palm, maybe I can be able to palpate the testes anywhere in the groin. If I'm able to palpate it anywhere in the groin, I will try and gently milk it down to the uh, scrotum and check whether or not it stays there because it could be an, an, an ascending uh, or a retracted testes. Um, I will also, if I cannot palpate it, I will palpate any of the ectopic sites such as the perineum, the um, <clears throat> contralateral testes, um, and, and um, the superficial inguinal pouch to see whether I can mm -hmm. palpate it in any other part um, in, an, in, in any ectopic site. You've examined, you're not able to milk down anything. Uh, the hemi left hemiscrotum appears empty. What are you going to tell the parents? So um, I'm worried he has an, um, um, an intra-abdominal um, testes. Um, and then the okay. testes. Mm -hmm. Though there is a possibility it could yeah. also be in the groin. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not able to palpate it uh, clinically. In that instance, my next line of management will be to schedule him um, for um, examination under anesthesia uh, with laparoscopy, uh, plus or minus um, um, orchidopexy. Okay, parents want to know why, because it's been there for three years, understand it. What is the concern? Why do you want to operate on the child? So the test is being located in an abnormal location, um, is prone to trauma, is prone to, um, um, and they can, can also can cause, a, uh, can cause uh, the child to have fertility problems in future. In addition, um, Test is in an abdominal lo lo location is prone to malignancy. So bringing it down, we allow uh, regular checks uh, to be able to detect any, uh, any abnormal any other, any other risks you can think of? Um, so trauma, tumor, fertility, cosmesis. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones that can come readily to my mind now. Okay. So fertility, you mentioned about fertility. So if it's an undescended testis and you do an orchidopexy, do you think it's going to improve the fertility at all? So the boy is already eight. So mm -hmm. the probability, um, so the, 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 the honest answer I will give the parents is that no, nobody knows for sure. Okay. Uh, the testis has been in an abnormal location for quite a while. So there's a possibility that it, the, the um, fertility potential of that testis may already have been impaired. Usually the contralateral testis is able to still maintain fertility, really. Okay, so what are the risk factors for undescended testes? Uh, so prematurity, mm -hmm. um, also um, family history, uh, uh, presence okay. of um, um, uh, congenital abnormalities with mm -hmm. um, deficient anterior abdominal uh, wall. Um, mm -hmm. And That's then- Do you think you're talking through the descent of the testes? Embryology? So, so the, the testes develops in the retroperitone um, and then usually uh, descends uh, down to the um, internal ring uh, at about the seventh month under the influence of testosterone, and then um, um, and then um, uh, with it, with um, and then by the ninth month we expect it to have passed through the deep ring um, into the um, into the scrotum. So you said in the retroperitoneum. Uh, what about the basic differentiation to say it's going to be a male gonad? Which gene is that? So it's the SRY gene, uh -huh. which um, if um, present uh, makes the uh, fetus to, to differentiate down a male pathway at the sixth week. 
Okay. While if absent, the differentiation down a female part. Right? That's fine. Okay, so you're, uh, you've counseled and consented the child. You're operating now, you made an incision. Um, you're able to locate the testis in the inguinal canal. Um, what are you gonna do? So it's close to the internal ring. So I will, I will, so in the boy has been properly, cons the, the, yeah, yeah. The, he's on table, you opened up. Okay, so I would, I would gently mobilize the testes. Um, usually in my practice, I divide the gubernaculum and I just gently um, mobilize the testes and the cord, taking care not to damage the cord structures. Okay. And then I bring down the testes into a subdatus pouch. And uh, if it comes with, without tension, that is what I would do. You're not able to do that, I'm afraid. Uh, you've skeletonized it as much as it's feasible. It just about reaches the uh, external ring. What are you going to do? So the boy may require a two-stage procedure in such an instance, um, in which case I will bring it down as much as I can the first time. And then I can um, I can come come back later to skeletonize. There is also um, and uh, some surgeons could also uh, carry out a two stage Fowler Stevens procedure at the first um, stage. Even uh, Fowler's in uh, inguinal testis. No, sorry, I sorry I withdraw that. Sorry, that's for abdominal. Sorry. So for for the for the groin, I will just um, skeletonize as much as possible, and I will bring it down as much as I can the first time. And then I can come back later and try and complete the question. Uh, anybody else you can ask? I can ask the, um, the vascular uh, surgeons or if I have a, a more senior uh, consultant colleague in my department who is more experienced in these surgeries that can also help me. Okay, that's fine. So you, you've left it at the external ring. What do you think would happen? Yeah, so... The you told the parent, yeah. The possibilities are the it's at the external ring now, so possibly uh, when we come back, we may be able to take it down. The other argument that I know some surgeons may do is the boy is eight already, so one, one could argue that it's just to do an orchidectomy in such an instance. Mm -hmm. So, guys, it's time, please. Okay, that's fine. How do you think you did? Uh, I think so many things I never expected. So I think I need to so broaden my... Uh, these are actual exam scenarios, okay. So let's go back to history. History is very important. You said dedicated pediatric clinic, etc. You said, my history was I'd been keen to know. I'll check the red book, you remember? Six yes. weeks check, red book, yes. clearly says whether the scrotal test is worse there and the scrotal cavity or not. History of, you know, what we just mentioned about delivery. So it's got to be very precise to say, was the child preterm? Any okay. associated congenital abnormalities, antenatal history? Was it ever present in a warm bath? It's a nice thing to ask parents. I'm sure you ask that in practice, but it's got to come out in the exam. Okay. okay. Previous surgical history is important. Family history is important. That's why it's trying to push you to say anything else on the history. Family history okay. of UDT. <laughs> When you examine a child, it's got to be a warm hand, remember, a warm atmosphere, okay? So it's yeah. a nice thing to say. Uh, before you touch the child, what are you gonna look at is to say that hemiscrotum, is it hypoplastic or not? If it is hypoplastic, that means it's a proper UDT, yeah, rather than a cinder testis. So it is yeah. worth saying that. Torsion, yeah. you mentioned about trauma, cancer, fertility, torsion, uh, under cinder yeah. testis, risk is high, okay? Um, so when you're stuck with the operative procedure, remember, you're not alone in the hospital. Always, always be submissive and say, I will call my senior consultant help for, you know, for, for help. Always say that. Okay. And they might push to say, oh, there's nobody around. What are you going to do? So I'd say in the patient's best interest, this is the best I can do. Leave the test is there. Come out. Okay. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you very uh, much. No problem. Good. All the best. I'll just add a couple of things. Um, the first thing is when you are using the gene names like SRY, try to get the full form and try to avoid abbreviations. And uh, if many students mention abbreviation, if you are able to expand and uh, say a one line extra about the gene, that will score you a good mark. The other thing is also the temperature uh, because uh, testes kept in scrotum is one or 
two degrees less than the body temperature. So torsion, temperature, trauma, it, it all comes in T. So it's easy to remember. Anyway, good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Okay. Bye. Bye. Finish. We got the trainee three already. Okay. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Is it uh, supposed to be me, Kamran? I'm not sure who's You're doing testicular cancer. Or... Yes, yes, Kamran. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. So time starts now. Um, you've been referred a 30 year old with a right sided testicular lump. Um, how are you going to assess him? Um, I will uh, see this patient in my specialist clinic as a two week. Mm -hmm. and uh, introduce uh, myself, check patient details. I'll take a focus history uh, and uh, examination and uh, arrange investigations in my focus history. Um, I will ask about the duration of symptoms and uh, any pain or any trauma. And uh, I will also ask about associated uh, urinary symptoms, any infections, any sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, bearing in mind uh, a chance of any epidermarchitis. Then I will also ask for risk factors, any history of previous testicular cancer, any uh, uh, understanding testes history, any um, uh, family history, any history of uh, HIV. And, um, HIV? Why? Uh, yes. And, um, Why HIV? Then, uh, HIV has a risk associated with seminoma. Mm, okay. Is that common? And, hmm? Is that common? No, it's not common, no. Okay, that's fine. Um, and, uh, there yeah. is history of uh, right undis in the testis, rectified as a child. Yeah. Uh, and that puts him at a risk. Fine. You've examined him with right testis feels concerning. What are you going to do? Um, I will uh, arrange uh, urgent investigations, including... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, testicular uh, markers and uh, um, and the count. I mean, a, a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And, right, all uh, that. What is the first uh, thing you would like to do? I'll, I'll examine him. Um, and that. And uh, no choice. And uh, I will uh, ultrasound, obviously, on Good. the same okay. day. So that's the, what the scan yeah, shows. Yeah. Talk me through the image, please. Uh, it shows uh, there is a hyperquick uh, uh, abnormality in the uh, in the testes mm -hmm. with uh, surrounding microlithiasis, mm -hmm. and um, which looks uh, uh, suspicious, and uh, uh, which uh, I'm gonna. Um, uh, counsel him for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a radical orchidectomy. Okay. Anything else you want to talk to him about? You mentioned about CT, mentioned about tumor markers. And uh, um, before I counsel him, I'll uh, talk to him about the uh, prosthesis and sperm banking okay. as well. What surprise, blood tests are they going to do for sperm preservation? Uh, I will do the uh, AFP. LDH and beta HCG. Or oh, sperm preservation, and, not tumor markers. For the sperm uh, banking, I will uh, H, H, Hep B, Hep C, HIV, and uh, uh, syphilis. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, syphilis. Okay, fine. How are you going to arrange that? Um, I will, uh, in my practice, I mean, we do it on the same day when uh, the patient first uh, is in clinic. So we try and do all these tests on the same day, including mark, tumor markers and everything. And does your centre have uh, facilities for sperm preservation? Um, we, we, we kind of arrange that uh, so that, you know, we, we send the blood, but we, we refer him urgently to the appropriate centre where this can be arranged, you know, as soon as possible. Okay. And then we, yeah. With COVID crisis, do you think, uh, if, you know, if you are planning for an orchidectomy, mm -hmm. can you do the sperm preservation after the orchidectomy? Or does it, it can be done after orchidectomy as well, if yeah. uh, there are any issues because of the COVID. So in that, the, the preference will be to, to, 
uh, you know, do the oculotomy as soon as possible. And then we can always plan the uh, sperm banking, uh, uh, you know, after right. if needed. So you've counseled them, ultrasound, the sonograph has said it's, it's a testicular tumor. You've done your bloods, you've requested a CT scan. Uh, what precautions are you going to take in theater when you operate on this chap? Um, I mean, uh, it, I will show that the patient is adequately uh, counseled and consented. And uh, uh, then uh, I, I will, um, uh, you know, uh, operation wise, uh, doing one incision and then uh, going through right, the layers. Doing and, all that as yeah. precautions. Precautions um, for doing uh, a high radical inguinal architectomy for testicular tumor. What precautions would you take? Um, I'm not sure. No. Okay. So, do you know what during the procedure, any precautions you can take? Well, I have to uh, try and preserve the ileum gunner nerve, uh, okay, which is at uh, risk of damage yeah. during the operation. Yeah. And, um, okay. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, so, you've done an orchidectomy. Would you do a prosthesis at the same point if the patient wishes? Well, if the patient wishes, yes, but in our practice, we try, um, uh, I mean, not to do it in case if he needs any, uh, you know, uh, further treatment. So, uh, but if he prefers it, and then if he don't suspect any uh, advanced disease, then... Um, How are you going you to know. determine that clinically? You wouldn't know that, isn't it? Yeah. So, your practice, you don't offer a prosthesis. Is that right? Uh, yes, but if uh, you know, if, if we don't normally do it unless you know, if we, if we feel that there, there's a risk of high, you know, uh, advanced disease, then yes. Okay. When you say about advanced disease, that's what I'm saying. It's not something you can assess clinically. Yeah. Uh, that makes any sense. No. Okay. Don't worry. Uh, Pre-op AFP is fourteen hundred. Beta is seventy-five thousand. What is the likely diagnosis? Uh, well. <clears throat> 75,000. So okay, the, AFP uh, is 1400. AFP is 1400. Then, uh, well, that, 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 there's a high chance he has a non seminal motor germ cell tumor okay. um, with such a high um, uh, oh. beta HCG. That's fine. So imagine the same patient when your system in clinic is very short of breath. What are your concerns? Well, I'm concerned he has uh, advanced uh, metastatic disease, and I'll call um, uh, my, uh, I mean, colleague oncologist immediately uh, to arrange uh, or a counsel patient and then refer him to oncology urgently for uh, uh, chemotherapy. Okay. And you say chemotherapy, any chemotherapeutic drug they would like to avoid at that stage? Uh, bleomycin, because okay. if he has chest metastasis then yes so you said about non seminomatous germ cell tumor uh, what are the risk factors you look for in histology the risk factors uh, we look for the size uh, and uh, any involvement of the red testes and any lymphovascular invasion and um, for non seminomatous uh, uh, and and the type, yeah, whether it's seminomatous or seminoma or non seminomatous, what type it is basically. Okay, so it is non seminomatous. You yeah. mentioned about size. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Histologically, uh, so you're discussing it at the MDT. Um, Don't worry, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so if, anywhere else you want to discuss this? We'll discuss in our MDT, uh, obviously, all the images and is uh, full body staging mm -hmm. uh, inclusive and uh, 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 as well. Okay. Uh, so do you deal with it at the local MDT itself or? Um, we uh, normally refer them to uh, oncology and then uh, then, then they it's be discussed in their uh, specialist MDT uh, with regards to further management. Okay. 
So does is your ten center a, a tertiary referral testicular center? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So you've done a CT. That's what it shows. Well, I can see that um, there's a large retroperitoneal lesion there, mm -hmm. um, which looks suspicious of lymph mm -hmm. over there. Okay. What are you going to do? Uh, well, in that case, this is a uh, is a. Uh, uh, I mean, I I need to review um, uh, the the full body imaging as well. Okay. You know, but the, so no other metastasis. This no is other metastasis. Mm -hmm. So this is, we label it stage two disease, mm -hmm. which is in, uh, with involving the lymph uh, nodes in the abdomen. And Wait, sorry? I mean, uh, around the, the, the pair. Please, it's time, please. Oh, yeah. How do you think you did? Um, well, I think the, the, the flow wasn't... Yeah. Uh, I think it's early in the morning. Sorry, man. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's tiring, I can imagine. The pace has to be slightly more swift. This is a yeah. straightforward scenario. Yeah. Easy to score seven. Mm. You started off beautifully. You said two-week wait, history examination, previous history of undescended testes. You did mention HIV as a risk factor. I try not to mention that. Okay. okay. You're just digging yourself. A lot of examiners won't like it. So common things first. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, listen to the question very carefully. Easy for us to slip. Yeah. If we'll be thinking of something else or we'll be stressed with the previous table. Please don't do that. Focus there and then. What the examiner asks, try to answer that particular question. It's very, very important. You mentioned about sperm preservation and blood tests. So even if you work in a tertiary referral center, just say my practice is to refer to the local fertility center where conventionally these are the blood tests which are done. Okay, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Processes, you got a valid point to say you don't offer it, although you could say, well, that option would be to offer because I'm aware some centers do offer it. And this is a study, yeah? Mr. Ramani mm -hmm. had done one. Uh, WHO check, you remember precautions. So it's like basic orthopedic procedures, for instance, yeah? Mm -hmm. Laminar flow, shaving on table, antibiotic cover, double glove, change of gloves for processes, no touch technique, betadine soaked processes, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, these are things which should just come one by one. It's just rattle it out and they'll say, fine, move on, move on, okay? Mm -hmm. You should know this. It's important. Uh, no bleomycin you mentioned. Risk factors on histology for non seminomatis uh, uh, Lymphovascular invasion and... Uh, uh, Proliferation I mean, rate. Embryonal complaints. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Yes. So <laughs> these should come out as bullet points. Okay. Risk mm -hmm. factors for seminoma is separate. Risk factors for non seminoma Just three, two or three points. The moment you start rattling out, they will know. You know yeah. the answer. They'll say move on. Okay. When they say move on, stop, then move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. our, our practice is to continue to talk. Don't do that. It's, it's risky. Um, rest of CT scan, you stalled a bit. Beautifully you mentioned about this lymph node. You should say, fine, this shows a large lymph nodal mass abutting the right uh, kidney. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would like to look, look at the rest of the images because I want to ensure there is no distant metastasis elsewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. So short and swift answers, and that will take you there. Uh, Supra regional MDT, I appreciate you work in a tertiary referral center, but please, please make it a practice. Uh, mm -hmm. Not There are not many supra regional uh, testicular cancer centers in the UK. So it's good practice to say, I will discuss it with the local MDT, and also this will go on to the supra regional uh, testicular MDT discussion. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, fine, good man. That's, that's fine. Thank Alan, you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good one, um, except for the initial bit, uh, he was a little bit um, jumping the guns and uh, you should not progress till you see the testicular tumor markers and the uh, scan images. Testicular mm -hmm. tumor markers, if you know a bit early in the stage that may slightly taken you in a different route, you may not be rushing to do an orchectomy with a patient with such a large high tumor markers, you may wish to stage him. And um, in the examination, Try to mention meticulous abdominal examination. Sometimes these masses, you can even palpate per abdomen. And also mm -hmm. mention about the left supraclavicular yeah. lymph nodes, which we yeah. usually discuss in the medical school. But once we become a specialist, we don't concentrate much on the examination points. And uh, these patients, sometimes if you do a CT chest or even a chest X-ray, they can have 
quite a widespread metastasis and patient may not be a good candidate for orthiectomy. We may have to give chemotherapy, stabilize the patient before taking even for any anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, try to say common things first, okay? So clinically, you're suspecting it to be a tumor. What are you going mm -hmm. to do next? Ultrasound, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Not tumor markers, not CT. First is ultrasound scan, and yeah. you will send off the patient for bloods, okay? Tumor mm -hmm. markers, you're not going to get it straight away. At least a scan is there to say, fine, this is my concern, this is what I'm going to do. But good, the pace has to be improved, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Ms. Bishas, we have trainee for Suresh. Okay. Morning. Good morning, Ms. Smith. Okay, so we're going to talk about bladder cancer. Time starts now. You've been referred a 40-year-old male, spina bifid, wheelchair-bound, with visible hematuria. He's had a long-term catheter for about 10 years. How are you going to assess him? Good morning. I will uh, arrange this patient to be seen uh, in my designated one-stop uh, uh, hematuria clinic, which is a two-week clinic. And uh, in that clinic, I will arrange uh, uh, for a urine dipstick and ultrasound KUB before I see him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I see him, I will uh, take focused physical examination and uh, arrange some investigations. And in the history, uh, I will focus uh, few questions about the hematuria. As he is with the catheter now, uh, uh, he, there is no point to ask which part of the stream or anything hematuria is coming, but obviously the pain or painless is very important and also the duration of hematuria. Mm -hmm. And along with that, uh, I will ask uh, questions about smoking, occupational history, uh, obviously, uh, if not for this particular, uh, maybe spina bifida, but uh, uh, I mean, concentrating about the others, I need to ask the occupations as well, and the uh, any drug history um, like uh, cyclophosphamide, phenacetine, okay. or uh, otherwise fit non-smoker, no occupational risk factors. As I said, he's spina bifid, wheelchair bound. And you mentioned about urine dipstick. So yes, he's had his visible hematuria sporadically for the last uh, several days. When you do a urine dipstick, it shows leukocytes and nitrites. What do you want to do? I will uh, take an MSU for uh, uh, this, is, uh, not MSU, but this uh, catheter sample. I will send it uh, for the culture and sensitivity and microscopy. Okay, so uh, he's in the hematuria clinic? Uh, no, I, I will send it, I, I mean, uh, to be available later on, or I mm -hmm. then. When I will see the, the referral initially, I will arrange it to be done before the patient comes to him to clinic. Okay, so G the GP is forgotten. The patient is in front of you. You've done yeah. a it shows leukocytes and nitrites. You said you'll send off a CSU. What else are you going to do for the patient? I will, I will uh, do a urine cytology as well. Cytology? Yes. Yeah. With a catheter specimen. Okay. Anything else? You said about cultures, leukocytes, nitrates positive. Yeah. So uh, then I will arrange the other tests. Uh, I mean, in, uh, I will arrange uh, the ultrasound already should have been done before I see the patient. Yeah, I'll come to the ultrasound in a minute. Any other tests you wanted? You've done bloods. You're going to see him face to face. Yeah. See a flexi yeah. clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I will arrange a flexible cystoscopy afterwards, after the ultrasound. Uh, when is leukocytes uh, and nitrates positive? No, not at this at that time. I will, uh, so obviously, uh, initially I will treat him with antibiotics and before sending the sample for cultural sensitivity, I will treat him and then wait for the sample's uh, result in a couple of days. And then uh, I will arrange to... Uh, change the antibiotics if required accordingly. Okay, so you're going to relist him for a flexi. That's fine. When you bring him back, the views are very poor on your flexible cystoscope. What are you going to do? 
if you uh, very poor uh, i mean like if it is uh, with very clear hematuria or Would clot clear hematuria that, yeah in that case then i need to arrange a basically a rigid cystoscopy and a bladder okay. wash fine when you're doing a ga cystoscopy you find a solid bladder tumor yeah you yes. can send the patient for a GA cystoscopy and proceed. Talk me through what are you going to do? It's and the posterior wall, a solid blood tumor. So for that uh, GA cystoscopy, I will uh, I will uh, initially uh, have uh, take the full consent uh, and uh, including the risk factors and uh, and in the theater after checking. Uh, uh, Done all that. Just talk me through about the procedure. Yeah. Okay, the patient is in the thought yeah, position. The resectoscope is in with a loop. Ah, okay, so I will uh, basically start with the urethroscopy as well as the, then the cystoscopy and I will wash out the bladder, remove the clots and uh, give a good irrigation to get, have a clear uh, vision. And then I will I look the tumor very carefully. I will look all around any other suspicious areas and then uh, I will... Uh, before that, uh, I have to do the uh, bimineral examination. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You've done all that. Okay. All right. You've got the resectoscope with the loop inside. The tumor is in front of you, looking at you. How are you going to resect? I will resect it uh, in uh, in parts and mm -hmm. pieces, and uh, making sure that uh, uh, the tumor completely is resected, and uh, also then I will take a deep. Uh, biopsy of, from the deep muscle and then take biopsy from the edge of the tumor as well. That's fine. So you've attained good hemostasis. You've got a three-way catheter. Anything else you want to do? Post uh, so postoperatively. So uh, then I will basically for this patient, I need to arrange a CT good. A CT Done thorax that. abdomen and pelvis for staging. Yeah. The CT image is in front of you. Can you talk me through, please? I expect not logged in. Uh, this. No, uh, in fact, I'm without camera. You can't see my image, can you? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I have to change. You can just look into your phone or whatever you are using. You can see the... In the Zoom platform, you can see the CT scan. I mean, uh, okay, uh, don't worry. It shows a, a, a hydronephrotic left kidney. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you've done a TURBT. Post op, you said you'll get a CT scan. How are you going to follow up this patient? So I have done the CT scan, and then uh, after that, I will uh, wait for the histology. And uh, after after histology and CT scan, I will wait. Uh, I will arrange uh, basically MDT discussion. Okay. And, MDT, and then I... your pathologist says it is a squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, high grade, but no muscle. Yeah, Thank so you. I will arrange a uh, uh, second look at TURBT mm -hmm. after Sorry. a couple of, couple of weeks and then uh, take the deep uh, muscle biopsy, TURBT as well as the deep muscle biopsy as well. For ACC of the bladder. Okay, For fine. You've done a re-resection. There's plenty of muscle which is free of tumor. Right. So, okay. So it, it means that the, it is not involving the muscle. It is uh, basically, it's a superficial one. So after that, then, uh, I mean, if uh, histology is available, then we will uh, obviously we'll discuss again in MDT. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the MDT recommendations, then uh, I will make a plan for the treatment. You are the MDT. Right. So for this patient, basically, uh, it's uh, there's a need uh, will be for radical cystectomy. 
Okay, you said it's non-muscle invasive. Mistake to me. Why? Because the most of these commercial carcinomas, mm -hmm. they they do not respond uh, well to the okay uh, good treatment. So the CT shows uh, a chronically hydronephrotic left kidney. Any other scans you want to do? Then uh, I will arrange a radioisotope. What radioisotope scan? Radioisotope. Uh, this is the DMS scan. Okay. So DMSA says 10% function in the left kidney. You mentioned about radical treatment. What radical treatment do you think you'll offer for this patient? If it is a 10%, uh, I mean, still, uh, I would be inclined for a radical cystectomy. Okay. What about the kidney? Kidney has got... Uh, Guys, it's kidney? time, please. Okay. Right, right. How do you think you did? I was uh, slow to... Mm. Your case has to be much quicker, I'm afraid. So loads okay. and loads of questions to be asked. And I'm sorry, maybe I found it a bit like an actual examiner, yeah. but this is how some of the examiners will be. Okay? No, that, yeah, 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 that's right. yeah, the pace is very, very important. Don't squander. When I say 40-year-old, spina bifida, I'm talking about a 40-year-old spina bifida. You should not say, well, not for this patient, but for the other patient, no. For this patient, what are you going to do? Okay? All right, right. Uh, cytology in a catheter specimen, it is going to be non-specific. Okay? So try not to say that. Oh, uh, right. I gave you plenty of clues. Long-term catheter, catheter-associated UTI, uh, biggest hallmark of NHS, millions of pounds goes for this every year. Okay? So mm -hmm. when a patient is referred with a long-term catheter, leukocytes, nitrites is positive. Nice way to answer that would be, I would review the previous MSU, I mean, CSU cultures mm -hmm. and assess the patient at that point. If the patient is symptomatic, I'll say it is safer to defer the procedure, send off a CSU, give them antibiotics and relist him for a flexible cystoscopy. But equally, they say, what if the patient is, does not have any symptoms? You could say it, it could be a catheter colonizer then I'll give the option of saying proceed with the flexible cystoscopy with some antibiotic cover versus deferring the flexible cystoscopy. So it's all a discussion with the patient what you routinely do in practice, okay? There is no one right or wrong answer. Um, MDT, try to bring it a bit quicker. So you, as I said, the pace should be much, much quicker. DMSA, you said that, good. Uh, so we would have gone into radical treatment. You said about cystectomy. Again, when I said there is no muscle in the specimen, but it is a CC, nice way to ask is I will ask my pathologist to say, is it primary SCC or is it urothelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation? Uh, and the right. examiner will say, no, no, it's pure SCC. So you could say pure SCC is muscle invasive unless proven otherwise. So mm -hmm. this needs discussed a discussion at the SMDT before you offer a resection. You're just delaying the process, isn't it? Yeah. With COVID, we think about re-resection. How many weeks are we talking about? Months, isn't it? Yeah. Which is not, not safe for the patient. Yeah. Uh, but practice, man. Practice and you'll be absolutely fine. Uh, okay. Anand, anything to add, please? Yeah. Just uh, one main thing which I always say is answer to that particular patient. So this particular patient is wheelchair-bound spina bifida. Do you have considered that aspect in your discussion? You should think about the level of spina bifida. It could be, yeah. Yeah. yeah, about T6, and you need to keep autonomic distal flexia right from flexible cystoscopy itself and uh, leave alone the T or BT later. And um, you should say about getting some fitness for the anesthesia. So, if you answer for the particular patient, believe me, the job will be more easy than discussing yeah. a general squamous cell carcinoma, which can lead you everywhere. Okay. On the Good. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All the best. Take care. Thank, thank you both. Thank you. No problem. Take care. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Suresh, we got our last trainee, trainee five. Yeah. Morning. Hi, good morning, uh, both of you. Yeah. Uh, good to start. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're on a ward round on a Saturday. 
uh, you've been referred a 25 year old lady with urinary incontinence and sudden onset of back pain. She does not have any sensation with bladder filling. How are you going to assess her? Um, I would like to uh, make sure she is uh, generally okay. Her, her general, uh, general well being is all right. I would like to take a focus history here uh, the onset <laughs> of the back pain. We're on the ward round. Are yeah. you going to leave the ward round and go, or are you going to finish the ward round and go? Oh, sorry, I thought this patient in my ward. Okay. All right. So I would ask the person who referred uh, about the patient's well being, and then I would see her as early as possible once I finish the ward round. Yep. Okay. Uh, but, um, uh, right. So uh, when, I, when I see her, I will take a focus history, ask about the back pain severity, onset, any past history of uh, back pain, any history of uh, trauma. She's in severe pain. pain. She's in severe pain. Um, and you know, pain is uncontrollable. Um, and as I said, there's no sensation of bladder filling. Okay, I would like to know about the weakness she fe feels in the legs or uh, numbness and pins and needles, which is suggestive of any Koda equina syndrome, which I suspect which is an emergency. So, I want to make sure that, and um, uh, I want to make sure whether she is in urine retention. I would uh, examine her, palpate her bladder, and also I would do a, uh, a focused neurological examination and um, do a DRE as well, uh, just to see the uh, tone of the anal or anus. And um, if a uh, bladder scan is available, I do a bladder scan. If she is in retention, I'll pass a catheter. And with regards to the uh, back pain, I would like to arrange a MRI scan for her to, to make sure that we don't, I don't miss any uh, sinister pathology. Uh, with you do the the MRI scan. What are the specific things you're going to ask in the history? Um, apart from what I told earlier, like um, the, the, the onset and duration and uh, any history of trauma, any uh, neurological, past neurological history right. or um, uh, with a fever, the patient is having fever, what is the reason for admission, why is she being treated for? Uh, and uh, he's in A. &E. Uh, he's not admitted yet. Oh, she's in A. All &E. oh, right. Okay. Um, I, I, I. Her general well-being: fever, localized tenderness. Okay. Uh, any other any other symptoms you can ask for? You mentioned about neurology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Bow, bow, bowel opening. Whether she passes okay. urine. Mm -hmm. Weakness. Okay. Anything yep. else specifically regarding her back pain? Um, whether she has any hematuria or, or loin, whether it's a loin pain with loin groin radiation. Okay, that's fine. You've done all that. You said about an MRI spine. That's what it shows. Yeah, uh, this is a T2 weighted image uh, which shows uh, L5, L4, L5 disc slip which compress the uh, nerves. Okay. So yeah. So I expect. What are you going to do? Uh, I would um, immediately uh, speak to my. I, I'll take it as a, a spinal cord compression injury, mm -hmm. and uh, I would speak to my orthopedic colleagues to get their opinion as early as possible. In the meantime, I would like to start her on dexamethasone, uh, sixteen milligram stat, followed by eight milligram uh, three times a uh, three times daily dose. Uh, I will. Eight I will, milligrams, three times a day. That's what I remember. I'm sorry, okay. yeah. Anything else you'll give with the steroids? Painkillers and... Uh, okay. That's fine. Sorry, what do you give steroids? It will help to reduce the edema around the, around the nerve. So it will, it will help to... Uh, what are the causes for cord equina? Uh, it could be um, malignancy, which... Uh, compresses the nerves and uh, uh, it could be trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's it. I, that's I can right. think of at the moment. Yeah, sorry. That's fine. What urological signs can you think of when you talk about cord equina? Uh, urinary retention mm -hmm. is primary. Uh, yeah, it's primarily urinary retention, acute urinary retention. Uh, the, the, as far as the urology is concerned. Okay, fine. So looking at the level of um, the um, nerve impingement, um, what, what do you think, 
will be her, you know, is it a safe bladder? What sort of injury you're thinking about? What level? It's a suprasacral level. Uh, so um, it's an acute injury. It's an acute mm -hmm. injury. So she will, uh, she, she, she will have a overactivity. If it is, since it's a suprasacral, she has an overactive blood and overactive uh, sphincter, basically. That's the hallmark of suprasacral injury. So okay. I would say uh, long term, it's an unsafe bladder. Okay. Um, how are you going to manage this? So you've spoken to your spine team. They said they'll sort out the spine. You started the patient on steroids. How are you going to follow her urologically? You said you've catheterized her. Yeah, yeah. 25. She's recovered uh, so, from the spinal bulk. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I would see her in my uh, uh, urology clinic. It comes in a wheelchair. Okay. When you see her in clinic, she's coming in a wheelchair. Okay. At this point, I would like to know how she is voiding, whether she still have catheter in yeah. situ. You she still have at home with the catheter. So she's All coming right. with the catheter. Okay. At this point, I would discuss with the patient uh, regarding removal of the catheter. In the meantime, I would like to involve my specialist nurse to teach her self-intermittent catheterization because if she goes into retention, she can do the self-intermittent catheterization. This patient needs a long follow-up with me in terms of her uh, bladder, bladder function and bowel function as well. Mm -hmm. So in, as far as the bladder function is concerned, I will, I will review her after maybe three months in my clinic. I will make sure that she is voiding or whether she is dependent on the catheter. And also, um, I would examine her to see the palpable bladder. But in the clinic, in the follow-up, I would like to have a post-viral residual scan and the urine diphtic to make sure that she is not uh, she's not having recurrent urine in infections and also she empties the bladder well. So my follow-up plan, as I mentioned earlier, it's a long-term follow-up. It depends on all uh, how she does in terms of her bladder voiding. Okay. So how are you going to follow her up? You said about ISC. Your ANP has started ISC. You're going to see her in three months. Yeah. Anyway, so, you will know. Yeah, go on. Yes, it, 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 it all depends on the symptoms. If, if she has... Uh, um, symptoms. I mean, she's, she's voiding naturally as well. So how are you going to know whether she needs long-term CISC or not? Yeah, it depends on the um, uh, post viral scan. And also, I would like to have a bladder diary to see yeah. her, uh, to see her uh, uh, capacity, bladder capacity, and also... Uh, it will give us, if she is doing a CIC or, uh, or voiding, I can see how much of urine she retains. So it depends on that. My management, I'll follow the management, depends on that. Any other tests you can do? I can do a video urodynamics uh, based on my other findings, based on my other findings, yeah. Okay. So what if this particular MRI image shows it's infrasacral? Yeah, usually infrasacral uh, are safe bladders, so the uh, they can do... Uh, reflex voiding and they can do the credia manure to void so usually it's safe bladder so in infrasacral what we want to make sure that whether they are uh, emptying or not uh, and uh, because if they don't empty they are at high risk of uh, in infection so in that case the management is little easier than suprasacral a CIC would help them or they have their own methods to void with credia manure okay um, we'll do another scenario we have got a 38 year old lady referred with urinary frequency and urinary incontinence. How are you going to assess her? I would like to see her in my dedicated incontinence clinic with uh, incontinence nurse specialist um, uh, with a pre filled uh, pre incontinence clinic. clinic. You said incontinence clinic? Is that right? I it's frequency and incontinence, isn't it? Yeah, so is it incontinence clinic you said? Oh, no, sorry, a neuro urology clinic, the female urology clinic. Uh -huh. Sorry. Um, so uh, with a pre-filled three-day bladder diary and uh, uh, incontinence questionnaire like ICIQ um, uh, short form and also uh, flow rate and post voidal and uh, dipstick are done beforehand. I would like to take a focus history uh, with regards to the type of incontinence, the duration and any precipitating factors, any past history, whether she has taken any treatment, whether it's improved and patient's concerns and the expectations. And also I would like to have uh, menstrual history and uh, gynecological history and obstetric history as well. And uh, is there any history of uh, diabetes mellitus and neurological disorders and other past medical history, including uh, her lifestyle, whether she's taking fizzy drinks and, um, and alcohol intake, smoking, um, and so on. And okay. then- yeah. You said about ICIQ short form, what does yeah. it comprise of? 
it, it, it has four questions, three of them are scored uh, up to 21 uh, points, like uh, how much they, uh, how, how much they, uh, how much the um, uh, incontinence and how often and uh, when do they have uh, incontinence. So it's a 21 score uh, questionnaire, three of them scored uh, uh, 0 to 21 and the fourth one will give us the, the, the instances where they have incontinence. Okay. It's time, guys. Right. How do you think you did? The first one, initially, I couldn't I get that. Second one, you saw the flow, so you could see yourself. Okay. So, principles are going to be the same. I know it's easier said than done when they give you something out of the blue. God, God Aquina, how often do we see it? Yeah. And, and in a young patient. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So, yeah. this came as a shock. And yeah. how you play, the pace has to come slowly. Slow down for a minute, okay? Slow down for five seconds to say, 25-year-old, I'm in the middle of a ward round. I've been asked to see a 25-year-old. That is the way they'll phrase it. I've been, you've been asked to see. That means you haven't seen the patient yet. So she's struggling with pain. So most important thing is to address her pain at first, okay? You didn't mention about analgesics. It's very, very important. You've got to empathize with the patient's symptoms, isn't it? So you say, Fine. I'll address the pain at first. See her as a matter of emergency. You got to register her with you. Remember, you're the consultant. You ask the registrar to carry on with the ward round, you would go and see this lady yourself. Okay. History wise, you said about onset of symptoms, etc. So, after optimizing her pain, I will take a short focus history, assessing her urinary symptoms. Okay. She, she's presented with new onset of query retention. Remember, you want to ask her about her preceding low urinary tract symptoms, red flag symptoms. Assess her performance status, past medical history, examine her in the presence of a chaperone. She's 25. Okay. So, uh, uh, good advice to all exam going candidates, male, female, child, please, please do mention chaperone. It's a safety net. Always safer than sorry. Uh, MRI scan, you did say spine team input. Steroids. You said 16 milligrams start with PPI cover. Don't you give omeprazole with that or lansoprazole? All right. Okay. Yeah. And then it's eight milligrams BD. Okay. okay. Um, BD of seven. So urological signs and quadriquena. Again, you can start from simple to all the way to retention. So you know with infrasacral, suprasacral, what sort of changes can happen with the urinary tract. Depending on that, you have to sell your answer. Yeah. Second one is absolutely fine. Uh, it's a female urology clinic, not an incontinence clinic, but that's fine. Uh, second one, you just sail through. You saw the pace with which. So work it out for tougher scenarios. You should have answers for all of them. Fine, man. All the best. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, yeah. what, is the, what are the yeah. urological uh, issues you expect other than urinary retention? I couldn't find... I couldn't all all sorts of symptoms you can talk about. Anything you write out is absolutely fine. Okay. You mentioned about, uh, you know, unsafe bladder. Oh, yeah. 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 Can we accept that in acute situation? I was a bit... Uh, so then spinal. they'll go into spinal shock, which right. is my next question. I didn't want to dwell too much into it. I thought, oh, let me give you okay. a second scenario to see how you're answering. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, neurological scenarios, um, even though they are a bit infrequent in our practice, once you get used to it, they're all much more straightforward. There is not much room to diverge and uh, you can easily expect the next question and where the examiner is leading to. Again, if you manage to complete and if you can pick the second scenario, that's sometime indirectly a very good sign that you have progressed well, but make sure you are progressing by ticking all the boxes and not leaving anything. Good job for now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank Thank you. Um, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Suresh, for you. another a very nice session. And um, thank you especially for your time during the weekends. That's no very, problem. very appreciated. Uh, any thank specific um, feedback from you? Um, I think uh, these were, some of them were tough scenarios, I should say. Um, but I think the candidates will have to. So um, the last kind of trainee's answer, you could see the second scenario, he came out so fluently. Uh, so it is very important for all the exam going trainees, think of rare scenarios, even then, how are you going to give an answer? More you practice, it becomes second nature. So even if you come across a very difficult one, 
you should be able to answer it nicely. Pause for five seconds. That's my good advice for everybody rather than rattling out answers straight away. Pause for five seconds. Trust me, you'll be able to answer it much better. What is your advice to do in between two, three stations, um, Suresh? Because nowadays in the exam, some people have like 40 minutes, sometimes even one and a half hours break between two sessions. And sometimes it's good if they utilize, but sometimes that will really take their mind away from the exam and we need to bring back and get the flow. It's difficult. What is it your is advice? Um, well, my, for instance, my, my exam, there was a, a very long delay, um, I mean, a gap in between. Uh, some people choose to have a good meal. Some people prefer to take a long walk. Some people go and sit and read their books. Some people take a short nap. Uh, for me, I'll normally have something to eat, have a coffee, flex a bit. Then 20, 25 minutes before the scenario, the next scenario starts, have a read. Try not to dwell into the previous scenario, which is the most important thing. The biggest chance of in a risk of failure for this exam is brooding about a, a scenario or a table which didn't go the way it should have gone. Um, try not to dwell too much into it. Trust me, you'll be absolutely fine. Well said. What is your learning source for neurourology? Any other books other than the usual guidelines? Uh, it's just bits and bobs from here and there, Anand. Um, I've uh, forwarded. Uh, something on our group worth sending that. I mean, um, it's just to make it simplify the, the whole process to say uh, whatever neurology scenario you get, how are you going to play it? Um, I didn't read any specific books as such. It is all a um, bit of exam material, what I've had here and there. And then it's my own preparation, I would say, even for the toughest scenarios. Amen. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you for your time and especially on a weekend. I wish you a very best for the rest of the weekend. For the trainees who have joined us in the YouTube, now you will be seeing Mr. Mathias did a first mock viva episode, which will be on your left side. On the center, there will be a subscription button. I'm sure everybody has subscribed. Please subscribe to keep in touch with the new episodes coming on. We are producing episodes almost every week. On the right side, you will be having the link for the full playlist. Thank you very much. Hereby, we declare class dismissed. Thank you.